Kia ora again. Um, yes, so thanks for that uh, introduction <laughs> again. Um, Greg, that's great. Uh, thanks so much. So I'm going to talk about um, basically uh, the Pacific Media Centre where we run uh, projects uh, around uh, the Asia-Pacific region uh, every year, and I'll tell you a bit about that in uh, detail shortly. But also uh, I run uh, the postgraduate paper in the second semester called Asia-Pacific uh, Journalism. Uh, and doing that paper is a um, very much a, a key thing about uh, being able to do the um, uh, projects. Now, um, as I'm going to be mostly talking about international journalism, but I think there's a, there's a truism that involves uh, journalism generally, is that uh, uh, journalism is really what somebody doesn't want you to publish um, or broadcast and so on. Everything else is advertising. And uh, as part of my talk, I'm going to tell you about some of the barrels and pitfalls of doing uh, international journalism. It does apply uh, to all journalism, but particularly in the Pacific, because we're always working in uh, zones uh, that can be dangerous, risky, um, culturally challenging, uh, and, and so on. So I've got a, I've got a slide up here um, showing at the moment uh, who is Pierre Renata. Um, and I wonder if anybody can uh, enlighten us. Pierre Renata. She's a household name at the moment. A journalism celebrity. We don't like to be uh, in the news ourselves as journalists, uh, but she is one at the moment. So nobody, nobody, nobody heard of Pierre Renata. This is not Pierre Renata on the screen. Actually, it's a body bodyguard at the Malacan Young. So I'm giving you uh, a couple of clues here to sort of uh, narrow it down. Does anyone know what the Malacan Young is? Presidential palace in uh, Manila. Um, who is the president of the Philippines? Anybody? President of the Philippines. He was in New Zealand a couple of years ago, and we had a really um, exclusive uh, story done by one of our graduates uh, here out of this program. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Who is the president of the Philippines? Notorious. Worse than, worse than uh, Trump. Absolutely notorious. Um, he w used to be uh, um, basically um, uh, Rodrigo de Tate is his name. Uh, and he used to be the mayor of Davao in um, the southern island of Mindanao in the Philippines. Um, and he's notorious because he uses um, uh, basically kill squads to wipe out people he doesn't like. Uh, and he's conducting a war on drugs in the Philippines, has been since he was elected in uh, 2016. And there are estimates between 7,000 people and 14,000 people dead in the Philippines as a result of his uh, policies. So we're getting a bit closer to um, what my question here. Um, so um, this is a bit uh, closer. DT um, stands for anybody might to. So Duterte, I've, I've given you a clue already here. Duterte trolls. This is one of the big uh, problems that uh, for journalism, I think these days, is a if you become unpopular as a journalist, the trolls. Fortunately, it's not quite so bad in New Zealand, but it's really a big problem in many other countries at the moment. Uh, Indonesia, for example, uh, the Philippines, um, any journalist that uh, writes stories that's going to be unpopular and so on becomes a target of the trolls for very vicious uh, uh, sort of attacks and so on. So this is, um, I'll just come back to there again, so I didn't uh, say, so this, this on the right there is uh, Pierre Renata. Um, she is a young journalist, who's a top political journalist for, uh, um, for a website uh, called Rappler. Um, the logo on the bottom right there, Rappler, uh, which has been a phenomenal success, um, has uh, several uh, million uh, uh, in the audience and so on, uh, started by Maria Ressa, who was a journalist working for CNN. Um, and she left CNN and started off uh, Rappler and has... Uh, uh, both uh, sites in the Philippines and in Indonesia. We work quite closely on the course uh, and uh, with the uh, Pacific Media Center with uh, Rappler. Very stimulating uh, website. But anyway, uh, Pierre, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, was banned from the presidential palace by uh, President Duterte, um, and he's gunning for her. Um, and I'm just going to show you a little, little clip here. Um, actually taken at the palace uh, shortly after she was barred and thrown out of the uh, presidential um, um, palace. Sorry, go back again. A Malacanang official says President Rodrigo Duterte himself ordered that Rappler reporter Pierre Anada be barred from entering Malacanang Palace. The Presidential Security Group on Tuesday morning stopped Renata from entering the new executive building in the Malacanang compound. 
After calls were made, the PSG informed Granada she could enter the NEP but not the palace itself. No reasons were given for this. Internal House Affairs Chief Jopi Avancena says he was instructed last night by the president to tell the PSG to bar Granada. GMA News also quotes Avancena as saying the ban includes Rappler CEO and executive editor Maria Ressa. Okay, just a message uh, from uh, Pia. Um, this has been going around the social media in the l last few days because she's been targeted uh, just about every day for the last uh, two weeks by the president and his uh, goons and so on. So I get a lot of messages asking me how, how I feel when Duterte puts me on the spot during press conferences. Trolls seem to want to make it appear that Duterte humiliated me. I feel the opposite. The more Duterte bullies me and other reporters, the more insecure and desperate he looks. People might not believe it, but I'm honestly amused when he berates me. I'm irritated, though, when he doesn't seem to understand or refuses to understand my questions or ignores them altogether. So I speak up through my articles and journalism in the hope that readers will use their judgment based on facts and reason instead of propaganda. Now, I have to say that something like about 93% of the population of the Philippines actually support Duterte. And, uh, and I've been following uh, the politics in the Philippines for quite a number of years. And as I say, um, he, Duterte is far worse than Trump and yet doesn't have uh, a very high profile here even though he's been to New Zealand. And I'm just going to move on to that because um, this was quite a celeb cele um, celebrated case involving one of our graduates, uh, Corazon Miller. Um, she got an exclusive interview with Duterte when he was here in November uh, 2016. And there was one reason, uh, particularly, why she got this exclusive uh, interview. And that is because she is a um, fluent Tagalog speaker. She was born in New Zealand, but her mother was uh, from the Philippines. And her mother wisely taught her uh, to speak uh, Tagalog as well as uh, English, and she also speaks Spanish now as well. Um, she's a journalist on the uh, Herald, um, but uh, she's moving on to the UK uh, very shortly. At the time that she did this uh, exclusive interview, she was on the Herald, um, and she tried her luck. Uh, she had heard that Duterte was speaking at a public uh, meeting um, in Auckland while he was here. Uh, he wasn't actually on a state visit. He was just travelling back to the Philippines from a state visit in South America in a couple of countries. Um, but he wanted to meet his uh, troll friends in, um, uh, in Auckland, quite a lot of them. <laughs> um, and so um, uh, Corazon actually heard about this. And so she fronted up, um, turned up there. Um, and she's quite tall and quite striking. I'll show a picture of her in a moment. Um, and she just spoke in Tagalog to him. Um, Duterte is uh, renowned as a womanizer. Uh, he's, he sort of um, takes a lot of notion, uh, notice of anybody, uh, any woman who is um, very, very attractive and so on. And so he immediately perked up and he agreed to do an interview uh, with her. Uh, very sleazy character. He actually asked her if she was married, etc., etc. Um, but anyway, uh, she got this exclusive story. Now you see the byline at the bottom, Gros and Miller. The time that this was published, it didn't have a byline. And I contacted Corey and I said, why? Why didn't you put the byline on? The trolls. She was really, really uh, scared of the trolls, even in New Zealand. Uh, because she knew uh, that once her name was there, um, that she would be targeted, uh, which she was, of course. Um, but anyway, I got her to agree that we would publish uh, her article uh, a couple of days later on Asia Pacific Report, which is uh, another publication coming out of the journalism program. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But um, we uh, got her to agree that we would put a byline on. Um, you don't see the byline there because it's a bit further down on the page. But um, she then subsequently did a story in the Weekend Herald uh, how she outed herself as the journalist uh, writing this, this story. I, I personally believe it's an award-winning uh, article, a series of articles, the two, the two as a package, because only one journalist in the country could have got that exclusive interview with her. Um, she didn't win the award. She was up against uh, the particular category uh, in the Canon Awards. Uh, she was up against uh, journalists who had been doing investigations for a number of weeks. So it's not a, certainly not a level playing field. But I think it's one of the best pieces of journalism, certainly international journalism, uh, done in New Zealand in, in, in recent years. Now, I've got another question here. 
Um, what is the Filipino diaspora? Why, why do we care? So what is the Filipino diaspora in New Zealand? Anybody got an idea of what the community is here? How many? How many uh, Filipinos are in New Zealand? Filipino Kiwis or uh, more recent arrivals? Because the uh, first wave of uh, Filipino uh, migrants uh, here was in about 1981 or so. Um, anybody stab a guess? Any guess? One? Uh, a bit over half, but uh, it's 40,000. 40,000. So 40,000. But you wouldn't think so, would you? Looking at the Herald or looking at other mo mainstream media. And I think this is an issue. I'm not going to get into this now because I don't really have time about that. But um, many of our communities in New Zealand, particularly in Auckland, we have such a diverse community, um, and yet uh, our mainstream media do, simply doesn't reflect uh, those, those uh, communities. Um, so it's a challenge for us, and I think a challenge for us on our journalism program um, about how well we cover these things. So I mentioned uh, the course that I, I teach, Asia Pacific Journalism. I've just thrown this um, uh, picture up here because these are a couple of students, uh, 2016, they were in Fiji. Um, they were from the course um, and they were over uh, to cover uh, events as one of the projects that we, we do and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. But I wanted to share with you one of the stories that came out uh, from that uh, assignment for a couple of weeks, mid-semester break, um, and this was by Nick Pedersen. Now, he did a story about climate change, uh, and this was shortly before Paris, COP21. Um, and it was a groundbreaking piece of journalism. So I'd just like to share that with you, because uh, he, he arrived without very little background about uh, um, Bainim Rama, the president of Fiji, uh, doing an initiative and setting up this new organization called the Pacific De Development uh, Foundation. Um, and he uh, managed to get a quite a number of leaders from around the Pacific together at this conference and uh, did a nice little piece around that. Smiling faces on stage at the Grand Pacific Hotel on Friday. One after another, seven leaders from the Pacific Island nations had just signed the first charter on climate change under the wings of the Pacific Islands Development Forum. The so-called Suva Declaration is a list of demands and expressions of concerns that the Pacific Islands in three months' time will take to COP21 in Paris. Well, I, I, I like it very much because uh, we put all our, all our thoughts all what we want to, um, you know, uh, present to the uh, COP 21 in Paris. Uh, the declaration that is going to be issued today uh, have our full support. We're very happy with what we signed. We are hopeful that uh, it will carry on to the other forum that we need to attend between now and Paris. But it is a very strong statement of, of, of uh, Pacific sentiment on what must be done with climate change. I think most of the views that are expressed are you uh, know views that we also share and it's important that we went to you know COP21 with one voice and I think that's the whole objective of this of this uh, of this forum and I think we have achieved it. But no one was probably more proud than the host of the event Fiji Prime Minister Vorek Bainamarama. The Suva Declaration is a is going to be an historic document an historic document moment in which the Pacific came together as one. The nations came together and signed the declaration after three days of careful negotiation at the Grand Pacific Hotel. But also about the inspiring leadership. An important stand from the Pacific nations according to UN Special Envoy for Climate Change Mary Robinson. I think it is a strong statement from the countries of the region, the small island, South Pacific states. And uh, I believe that there was a very good, strong mood about adopting this resolution because it also had support from the civil society and from business. And people know the situation is very serious. I think it's important that this voice is heard in Paris. Um, nice piece of journalism. Um, one of the tests, I think, in doing in any kind of international journalism is uh, being able to hit the ground running 
and being able to get background together very, very quickly and being able to put together a, uh, a compelling uh, story like, like this one. I'll just ca actually come back from a climate change conference in Wellington and say Papa which is a very invigorating, uh, stimulating uh, experience. The sort of uh, people that you meet in a conference like this is, uh, is really quite something. Um, the person that we saw just before the end of that uh, program, Tony de Brum, uh, from the Marshall Islands. Uh, he was the foreign minister and a great uh, advocate around uh, climate change issues. He, he unfortunately uh, passed away just recently. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of uh, a brief little items um, uh, and then I'm going to show, uh, tell you about the uh, opportunities uh, this year. Um, Alistair Qatar, she was in Fiji in 2014, and um, she w uh, covered the elections, uh, first elections there after the uh, coup in two, uh, 2006. Um, so it was a very groundbreaking time to sort of be there. Um, but while she was there covering the elections, uh, there was a, a whole group of um, Fijian soldiers, peacekeepers uh, in the Middle East, in Syria, on the Golan Heights, who were unarmed and taken hostage. And um, so she covered this from Fiji as a combination of uh, using uh, 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 social media, um, um, using the uh, resources of the uh, Fiji government, uh, the material they got, and also who interviews. So I would like to show you this. The uh, sound on that is a bit, uh, bit rough. Um, she was working under incredibly difficult uh, circumstances on, on the laptop with um, a, a software that uh, wasn't working too well. But it's a very interesting sort of uh, story. The Fijian peacekeepers in Syria have finally been released. In this video on YouTube channel Talan, the men can be seen being welcomed and reaching safety. And at a press conference this morning, Prime Minister Vorenge Banemarama says the soldiers are heroes. These uh, 45 men are heroes. They kept their cool and showed restraint under the most extreme circumstances imaginable. In a video released online yesterday showing the 45 alive, Private Savenada Sawatambao Rambuka said the soldiers were happy to be coming home soon. We've been informed uh, that we will be released soon and uh, we are all very happy to be going home. Brigadier General Mosese Tiku Tonga says the soldiers were released across the Kenetra crossing point in Golan Heights last night at 11.50pm Fiji time. He says they were all in high spirits. Uh, we spoke to them. I spoke uh, to Captain Rumbuka straight after they came across. Uh, they were all in high spirits. Um, then we spoke to them again this morning, our time. Uh, they were in a, a grog ceremony after a welcoming church service for them. Uh, we could see the singing dringy on the background, uh, all the laughter, so they were all back to Fijian moods. Brigadier General Tiko Tonga says the soldiers were able to call their families in Fiji as soon as they had crossed. Baina Marama says he is sure the soldiers will return to their duties. Our men will need to be debriefed and they obviously deserve a period of rest before they return to their duties. But I know that they are all keen to continue their mission. Alistair Carter for Wansawara. Uh, as I'm running out of time. Um, and this was an award-winning um, uh, story, a series of stories uh, in Fiji last year, Tukuraki's story of uh, survival. Um, and uh, you can actually see this on the Pacific uh, Media Center's uh, YouTube channel. Um, but uh, Julie Cleaver and Kendall uh, Hutt, who did the Bearing Witness Project uh, in Fiji, uh, won the uh, DART Asia Pacific uh, Award for Trauma Journalism. Uh, basically telling a story of uh, a group of villagers who survived a mudslide uh, and two cyclones in a period of uh, four years and the people have been moved to another, another village. It's a really compelling piece of video so I really recommend it to actually go and have a look at it on the YouTube channel. Now I just want to tell you about the opportunities uh, for this year. So we do a project called Bearing Witness. Uh, which is uh, two weeks um, in Fiji during the mid-semester break. It's a fairly full-on experience um, and need to hit the deck running sort of thing. Uh, so we're looking at uh, the dates of April 24th, uh, sorry, 14th to 28th. And it's a climate change project. We've been doing that for two years now and this is the third year that we'll be doing it. 
Um, and uh, the people who do it will be staying at the University of the South Pacific campus, wonderful campus, very beautiful, um, and um, based around the uh, PACE, which is the uh, Pacific uh, Centre for Environmental Research, uh, and also the USP Journalism Program. So we'll be uh, circulating. I've got some flyers uh, sitting over there, th just in front of you there. So what's your name? Kim, right, great. There's a whole lot of flyers there that about all, all these projects that I'm telling you about now. Um, so the deadline is actually to apply for this is uh, 4 o'clock on a Friday. Uh, we fund the airfares and we fund uh, the accommodation. Uh, we give a little bit of a koha for um, living expenses, but it's very cheap living in Fiji, but you would have to top up a little bit yourselves. The next project is the Pacific Media Watch project where we pay uh, someone for 10 hours a week uh, for the whole year. Um, this has been a very popular project over the last few years and I mentioned a couple of people, Alistair Qatar for example is in Fiji. Uh, she did the project and now she's a presenter and a key journalist on Tangata Pacifica. Um, so it's a really good uh, introduction in preparing yourself uh, for a uh, career. So that's the 10 hours a week paid um, and uh, mainly reporting um, uh, and editing on media freedom stories uh, throughout the region but it's all, quite a lot of uh, general stories also get covered as part of the project. We also have a new project that started last year and will be running this year with the New Zealand Institute for Pacific Research where we um, basically uh, have somebody uh, contracted to work with the Institute doing a whole series of profiles and stories about uh, some of the researchers from around the Pacific, a lot of really interesting stories, uh, working very in close lies and with the um, Institute itself. The Pacific uh, Media Centre runs that project uh, and you're actually paid uh, from the school but it's working very closely in liaison with uh, the Institute itself. Um, so, and we also have got um, the Asia Pacific Report, um, which I'm, I should show you in the next uh, slide here, I think, uh, which is uh, like Te Wānui. Uh, it's uh, one of our publications in the journalism program. And this one specialises in international journalism and the Asia Pacific region. Uh, our largest uh, single audience is New Zealand, but also we have big audiences in the Philippines and in Indonesia. Uh, and also in Australia and the US, Fiji, Papua New Guinea and so on. Uh, we run a lot of stories that no one else has. Um, and it's a combination of both our journalism uh, uh, students work, but also journalists all around the region and academics all around the region contributed. So your work is seen uh, in relation to a lot of other work in the region. So you get quite a high readership. 20,000 is roughly about the figure we have at the moment. So that's basically uh, that in a nutshell. And I think we've got time for just a few questions. We've got uh, time. David, yeah. what about yeah. the Samoan Observer? Sorry? The Samoan Observer. The Samoan, Samoan, Samoan Observer. Observer, the Observer uh, Oh, well, yes, yes. Well, we, have, we haven't got anything sort of formal around that. But um, should, we, uh, should we mention that as a possibility? Um, yes, the Samoan Observer has uh, approached us. They want to have a... Um, um, uh, basically, they're offering an internship, so we should be able to announce that something uh, fairly fairly soon. Uh, so that would be a paid paid uh, position uh, with the Samoa Observer. For the last three years, we've had um, uh, some of our students go over on internships there for a couple of couple of years, not just with Observer alone, but all the Samoa media, and they've all had a fantastic time. It's a really tremendous experience. Um, so uh, watch the space, uh, we will have some information about that a little bit later on and that'll be for next year, after for, uh, that, that'll be something that appeals to anybody um, graduating. So we'll keep you posted on that. Look, I'll skip these, these are, these are just um, uh, I think a bit of background, some of the materials that we have which we'll deal with in the uh, course itself. But have we got time for a few questions? Anybody like to know a little bit more about uh, these, these opportunities? Opportunities. As I say, we've got flyers over there, and I'll circulate it through Louise uh, for for everybody as well. But the deadlines for all these applications are at four o'clock on uh, Friday. Send to Jesse. Uh, what we'd need is your um, uh, basically uh, a covering letter saying why you want to do the particular project, which one you'd li like to do, um, and uh, um, a CV. Uh, and a bit of profile about uh, why you think that uh, you'd be able to do, do this particular opportunity quite well. So any, any questions? I'm sure there must be a few burning questions.
Anybody interested in applying for some of the... I'm <laughs> eligible. I <laughs> always wanted to do our internship, actually. If you, if you haven't got a question now, but later yes. you think, what was that thing, then come and see me and I'll put you in touch with David, or, or yes. I can probably answer some of your questions anyway. Yeah. Um, but if it gets sort of complex, then, then I'll send you to David, but yeah. And, and just to tell you too, um, because I'm hanging out in a uh, slightly different place from the rest of the journalism team, I'm actually on the 10th floor. Pacific, you'll see the big sign, Pacific Media Centre. Come looking for me there, and I'll uh, be happy to, to give you any background. Or we did have one question down the back there. Yep. When, it, when is it taking place? Now, sorry. When, when are they taking place again? Okay, so it depends right. which one you mean. Yes. So, so basically we've got the Bearing Witness Project, uh, which we actually have a course for that, International Journalism uh, Project. So you can, actually, you can actually roll for that. It's 150 hours. Basically, it's intensive for the two, two weeks, but you also have some preparation work beforehand as part of the 150 hours, and then there's work afterwards, such as making videos and um, reflective articles and things like that. So that's the Bearing Witness Climate Change Project, and we'll be looking for two people to go on that. We like to, like to send people in pairs so you've got a bit of su support for each other because it's, a, it's quite a challenging uh, you know, experience. So it's a lot more fun if you're actually with uh, um, a buddy. Um, so uh, Pacific Media Watch as a paid, a paid job all, all year. Um, that's 10 hours a week and that's negotiable when those hours. It's very flexible and it's something that fits in really well with your studies. Um, and it's a natural sort of follow on. Um, and then the other one is the New Zealand Institute for uh, Pacific uh, Research, which is also 10 hours a week, and that'll be ma based mainly over at Auckland University. Uh, that's that's where, um, but done from done largely done from here. But they'll be liaising with uh, the team over there, so it means they'll be going over to the Fale uh, and meeting uh, quite a number of the Pacific people. Most of the Institute people that are involved in projects are actually based there. Although AUT is one of the partners. So it could be so it could be even academics on campus uh, here and so on. Um, you'll see that uh, on the note, uh, information notes there, I've got uh, a link to the stories that were done last year by the team who, who did it last year, um, Hilly and um, the Brandon. Uh, really good stories. Um, so it's a good opportunity. There, there are a lot of details in that. So um, grab a flyer. Uh, if that doesn't answer questions, come and see me because I appreciate what, you know which ones you know when is important, right? So we'll, we'll talk after it. Um, all right. Yep. Great. So look, the Pacific Media Centre. I just want to support David's crop up here. The Pacific Media Centre seriously makes AUT unique. AUT journalism is unique anyway, but it's doubly unique if you can be doubly unique. Uh, because of the Pacific Media Centre and David's many, many years work over the years. Really, without him, I can talk about him because he's leaving. Without him, New Zealand would know so much less about the Pacific and Asia political sphere than we do. So, you could be part of what is an incredibly important uh, function, if you like, in the socio political arena that we have here at AUT. And what David's done is just incredible. Is that a question? If you do take part. How about we just use our names as, as we ask questions? Grace, um, if you choose to take part in any of these things, um, oh, not really the Pacific Media Centre, but yeah. the other yeah. um, exchanges, would you kind of get some slack? in terms of other assignments, because 150 hours seems a bit... So, uh, a the 150 bit. hours is two weeks in Fiji. Okay, so but what if we had assignments during that time? Well, then you would negotiate with your lecturers, I guess, yeah. yeah.